we do have to deal with their courts, it is clear that there is proof that when we act in the office of general executor, that there is proof that we are in fact in that role. Now, if you are struggling, as many people are struggling, with facing court, here's another benefit. The general executor, providing there is a public record of the general executor being appointed to the role, the general executor has the power to issue a warrant. That, in fact, is what a warrant truly is. A warrant is the entrusting of the powers of the executor or the general executor to an agent. It's the creation of a temporary trust. That's why a warrant has always needed a date, a time, an expiry. Warrants expire because they're trust, they're temporary trust. If you don't have a time or a date on a warrant, it cannot be a valid warrant because no entrusting took place because there is no expiry. If there's no expiry, it can't be a temporary trust, therefore it cannot be a valid warrant. That's, that's another simple way to argue about a valid warrant. A warrant needs to have an expiry date and it needs to be signed by an executor, granting and creating an agent under immunity holding the powers of the executor. That's a warrant. So, as a general executor, you can appoint an agent. You can appoint an administrator, one that holds the power of the executor to attend court by special visitation to clean up the matters that are before the court. And you can physically create a warrant. And imagine what the administrator can do when they go to court. Here's my warrant from the general executor. And here's the proof on the public record that the general executive has been appointed to the office of the estate. Where's your warrant? You show me your warrant, judge, magistrate. If you don't have a warrant, then I am convening a court of public record. By this warrant, I am convening a court of public record because I am standing here with the effective powers of the general executive. What powers do you have, judge? What powers do you have, Magistrate? Now, I know from a number of you when we talk about court that the emphasis of the private bar guild, the tricky pedants that many of them unfortunately are, is shifting from trying to get you into a psych eval to simply going for contempt of court. Really, this is an issue of making sure that your preparation of documentation is clear. Contempt of court, and we need to do more work on this, but it is my understanding that contempt of court, real contempt of court, can only be affected if it is an administrative hearing and if you indeed have, have agreed to appoint the judge's agent. A judge cannot immediately issue a contempt of court unless it has been established as an administrative, proper administrative hearing. In other words, most of the contempt of court threats are merely offers, idle threats. Now let's present another piece of important information when we're going into these courts. When we go to court, if we have to go to court, I hope that you are appointing an administrator by warrant, and it probably is a better thing to appoint an administrator by warrant rather than to attend in the uh, occupant of the Office of General Executor. Why? Because the Queen doesn't go to court. It really is uh, a, a thing that a General Executor wouldn't do. It wouldn't belittle a General Executor to go to a surrogate court, an administrative hearing. One would appoint an administrator to go and do that. So it's probably better to have a warrant issued and appoint an administrator on your behalf. And there's especially a preferable thing to do when you're looking for someone who has the auricular skills to speak to the judge. But let's move on. Let's talk about another thing of these probate courts. 
last week when I was speaking uh, with uh, Rod, on Rod Class's uh, show, he raised the point that there is evidence now that they are openly admitting that the judge and indeed many of the officials in court are acting as independent contractors. Now, what is one of the obvious things that proves the truth of this? And then I want to show you a weakness on their system when you see it. Well, the truth if we're dealing with independent contractors is if there's any sign that they are conducting business in the court. Now, how many of you looked at the sign of the judge? When you go into court and there's a higher bench there, someone sitting there, it should be self-evident they're the judge. You don't need a sign. You don't need a nameplate. That's what it's called, a nameplate for the judge, do you? I mean, if someone's sitting there, they're the judge. They're in a higher position. They're in a black robe. There wouldn't be anyone in the court that wouldn't mistake them. They're not the janitor. They're not the clerk. They're sitting in that position. They're the judge. They're the presumed judge. So why the nameplate? Well, I suggest to you that, again, one of the indemnities of the corporation, this is for the benefit of the corporation, not for the judge, for the benefit of the corporation, so you can't go after the corporation, is that that particular individual is conducting their own business. Imagine if they had a uh, sign at the front. It's the Judge Franco Collins business. He is running his own shop. He has his own nameplate, and he is an independent contractor. Now, what you will find in statute is that if you go to court and you're able to establish that the man and woman in front of you has some pecuniary interest to gain in the matter at hand, then they have a conflict of interest. They cannot be considered an independent arbiter. How can they? So if you encounter any judge, any magistrate that is belligerent and rude, you can simply ask, are you conducting business on your own behalf? They might try and obscure that and, and run around it. The fact is they are conducting business on their own behalf. They are an independent contractor running their own business. Why? Because they've got a nameplate, for God's sake, in front of you. Well, if they're running their own business, they cannot be an independent arbiter because they are making money. They have a vested interest. So I hope for those of you that have been frustrated, fearful and concerned on how, if you are forced to go to their courts, you now know that if you've perfected the public record, that you can issue a warrant and appoint a administrator. And we will have that example. Now, I gave up a list there. Uh, and a number of you are going to ask, uh, when can you see an example of how to do that? We will have an example soon on that. But there isn't yet an example up on the site. And I'm sorry, this is something that will be coming uh, in the coming days. Now, the same applies... And I've asked you all, if you could, please go to globe-union-court and click on the section of Will and Testament and Probate Law. You will see a section that says Will Examples. And there are now a number of Will Examples, and I've put up there the Will Example of Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Mark Twain, Walt Disney, and Leona Helmsley as examples of Wills and Testament. And it's worth reading those. It's worth downloading having a look at those. There's a section two there that says example wills and testament. And while I said last week that we'd have an example up there, the only delays that we have, and there isn't yet an example up there, and I apologise, is that we are working on perfecting not only the will itself, which will be an instrument recorded on Eucadia, but we're also perfecting the notice that we wish to have recorded in the public record of either the county recorder if they deny as a non-UCC filing 
or if that is refused, as a gazette notice in the any gazette. And either way, we will be able to perfect and give notice to the Secretary of State that uh, as a public record, uh, the existence of our will and indeed the appointment of the occupant of the Office of General Executor has been perfected. Well, in the time available, so I hope some of those important insights in terms of, of probate, will and testament, uh, you finding useful. And you will see an example of how to appoint a administrator as the Office of General Executor. And you will see this example, Will. But we're still working through these, these elements. And they're very, very important elements. I want to talk to you about documents that we're doing because we are talking about examples and I want to talk to you about their fair use and I want to talk to you also about all controversies must be resolved as you can in the time available. Well, there is always a risk when this information is shared that we don't yet have the full picture because we continue to unearth the elements of their law. And in some cases, how they do things are incredibly simple, like the example like switching from perfection of instruments, notorial perfection, to the publication of instruments being the emphasis now. In some cases, it's quite complicated. Uh, the complexities of bankruptcy, the complexities of the administration of the estate, uh, the complexities uh, of what instruments have been created and how they are managing these estates. This week, there was an example that some of you may have heard that individuals that came on and used the instruments of the ecclesiastical deed polls were arrested in a number of states, including Missouri and Kansas, for other activities that they did that had no bearing whatsoever on UK, they had no bearing whatsoever on the canons or on anything that we have done. Instead, what they did was they used this in conjunction with the activities that they were doing in regards to claiming massive refunds from the IRS for which they were not entitled. And as a result of using these instruments, there has been published in a number of newspapers the claims by US attorneys that they wish to have struck from the record particular references to ecclesiastical deed poll and words that are strung together that make no sense. I raise this for three things. The first is that when we're dealing with the court and we're dealing with the system, 99.99% of them haven't got a clue about the history of their system. They're not taught it. They don't want to know it. And if they know it, they'll deny it. For the most part, these people haven't got a clue. They were trained on a principle called legal realism, which states that from an arbitrary point forward, everything is statute, or I should say everything is precedent, everything is procedure, and form over substance every time. If the procedure is perfected, it doesn't matter if the decision is unjust. Hence, you can execute a man where there's no evidence, that he did it, where seven out of the nine witnesses say that what they said wasn't true, providing the court proceeding was done perfected, there is no obligation for the state to overturn the decision, so you can execute an innocent man. That is the absurdity and the stupidity that is the pinnacle and the highlight of what you're dealing with. You are dealing with stupid morons. You're dealing with the most idiotic, mentally insane people who have ever graced the bar. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with morons. And they wouldn't know law if they fell over on it. That's what you're dealing with. Admittedly, thankfully, in some respect, they're just clinging to the system. They're just clinging to the policies and the instructions they're given. But they're a hair's breadth away 